Intelligence Institute, an institute within Deakin University. Um, so Deakin University, there's two campuses, one in Melbourne in the city, which is Burwood based, and then there's one in Geelong. We're primarily based in Burwood. We also have um, another, the A squared, I squared Institute in Geelong that does a lot of the fundamental research. Overall, Deakin University has about 60,000 um, students. These results are post-COVID. Um, so we've got a lot of international students that are also coming back as well. Um, so we have 1.3 billion income that comes in annually at Deakin University. Uh, 127 is uh, from research income. I'll go through the different categories of the research incomes that we have. And then we also have $140 million of uh, spin-off from equity value. So in Australia, we've got four categories of grants. Um, we've got the first, which is the Australian Competitive Grant. Uh, these include the Australian Research Centre, NHMRC, and the MRFF. The NHMRC and MRFF are both medical-based. The ARC can be on anything. Those usually cover two to five years. Um, there is, I know that there are some grants from the MRFF that allow for international collaboration, but they're not paid or funded from the MRFF. The ARC does allow for international collaboration with funding. Then we have the um, research income from government. So this includes federal and state. So Australia is, uh, it works just like America. So we have different state, states, which means that when you apply for funding, you can go for state funding and go to each different states or there's the federal funding. Then we have industry funding. So we have direct connections with um, industry in which they fund the research that they want. Um, and then there's also international private sectors as well that falls into the third category. And then the fourth is the Corporate Research Centre. Um, and this is from the Oz Industry Department. And there's two, uh, two different categories, one which lasts for 10 years and the other for three years. This also allows for international funding. So A squared, I squared was established formally in 2017. Um, overall, there's 30 years of experience in AI and software engineering. We have over 90 um, staff members, including academic engineers and PhD students. So the Institute is set up where we have our research fellows, we have uh, data scientists, data engineers, research engineers, and software engineers that help also develop the systems that we deploy the AI into. So these are our statistics over the last five years. Um, we pretty successful in getting grants through the door and getting funding for the projects. Um, a lot of the projects that we do deliver for industry, they get deployed. So we have a lot of returning clients as well that come back to us for further projects. Um, so a lot of the work that we do, as, as mentioned, we do in the real world settings, we actually look at having a direct impact into society um, and improving society, the environment and the economy. We also look at having a human in the loop approach. So we always have, when we deploy it in the real world, we have what we call a subject matter expert um, being able to use it and to approve it. So we've worked with nurses, we've worked with doctors, psychologists, and they all have access to that technology and they will accept or override decisions that are made, for example. So we can see that it's not clearly just an independent AI tool without getting uh, clinically validated. So the national priorities that Australia has, we look at closely um, defence space, food and beverage, resources, medical and recycling. Uh, in February 2022, the Australian government um, said that they want to try and push more research to be applied research and to work with industry partners. So then they've come up with a trailblazer program in which we look at the governments looked at having um, industry partners collaborate with universities. And we're also looking at um, research that is at the TRL, so the technology ready level of four and above. So NASA's got the, I'm not sure if you're across the NASA TRL scales. Um, so we have the 
A squared I squared team at Bur at Geelong that focuses on the um, fundamental research, which which is about two or three, and then our team at Bur will take it four, five, and above when we do the applied research. So a lot of the work that we do, putting it in the real world, we look at um, how the current workflows work in the real world. How can we look at using AI and ML to embed these into um, their workflows, and then we do observational studies to be able to test it to see how it works. Uh, so this is an example from one of the projects that I had, which was with the ambulance and the hospitals, and it's the pre-hospital notification. So when a paramedic calls up the hospital um, to tell them that a patient is coming in and what their workflow is and trying to automate that. So this is the current workflow and you can see these are all the actions that are taken from um, the nurses or the doctors and this is the proposed workflow that we created so it's being able to reduce all those extra steps within the hospitals um, and I'm not sure what the state is in Greece in Australia there's a, a large shortage of staff in hospitals nurses doctors so all this technology it's um, it's important to be able to maintain the, the, the status of the hospitals um, with the limited resources that they have. Uh, these are a few of the awards that that we've um, that we've won over the last couple of years. And I'll just go into the projects. So the first project is the um, trauma resuscitation and reception uh, system. It's a clinical decision support system. This was built with uh, doctors, clinicians at the Alfred in the trauma center. Um, and what it does is it has, um, it's a system that sh shows and reminds the clinicians of actions that need to be taken. And based on the readings from all the data that's captured, what they should look at and prioritize. Um, so obviously it's, you know, it's, been trialed it was trialed and now it's actually running in three or four four different countries um so it's resulted in 21 percent reduction of errors in mission and 30 percent reduction in blood being administered the reduction in blood was actually a side effect we that wasn't the goal of the system but we ended up seeing that that also helped reduce the blood that was needed from using the system so I'm not sure there's no audio here Okay. Talk with Ted. So this is an avatar and it's designed and has been used to train nurses that deal with people that suffer from dementia. So when you're dealing with people that suffer from dementia, you have to be able to talk to them in a specific way to get them to do what you want them to do. For example, to, for them to go and have a bath or shower. So this actually you talk to the person, to this person, and if you're not talking the right way, he doesn't react. So you have to try, and then it gives you feedback that you're not saying it correctly. Try and follow his, um, what he's saying and what is what are his interests, engage with him with his interests so you can create that trust to get him to do what you want. Um, I've got a video, but I'm not sure if I've, the audio will come out. Let's just see. My name is Ted. People come and help me with things I do each day. Perhaps you could try to help me now. It is a really... So it's just a small example. Okay. okay. Eddie, again, it's with Dementia Australia. And a lot of the times when people living with dementia... Um, there are carers, formal informal carers that aren't aware of the side effects or what dementia actually means. And so the setting of the, the house setting isn't set up appropriately and it causes the people with dementia a lot of um, anxiety. So this allows the users to be able to see how the people living with dementia actually see the world. So I've got a video. What are you doing? You went to the toilet an hour ago.
So all the stripes on the wall and on the cover, that doesn't help the person with dementia. So it actually just shows that through the video at how confusing it can be for that person to find their way and navigate through the house. Brain track, this is a cognitive assessment tool. So it's, again, with people with dementia, um, there are apps and they ask a set of questions to be able to look at the your cognitive load over a period of time to see if it's improving or decreasing. And then it just suggests, gives recommendations to go and see a doctor to assess whether you have um, any symptoms of on or onset of dementia. So this one's actually has 40,000 downloads since October, 2022. That's been successful. The SunSmart Global UV, this was done with um, Cancer Council of Victoria. It's also been endorsed by the World Health Organization. And it's um, just to be able to remind people of the UV that is out there to, and for them to protect themselves. Um, and so they, you know, it's again to try and reduce the, the cancer, the amount of cancer that cases that occur. This is a big problem in Australia. Sophie Hub is an assisted living technology and what it does is it monitors the behavior of the elderly and then um, when there is abnormal behavior that is detected, it sends an alert to formal carers or informal carers stating that something has gone, gone wrong and to, to check up on them. So this is also a commercial product. PIMS is what we did this during the pandemic. Um, so this one was done with uh, clinicians and what we did was created a remote monitoring system um, for COVID positive patients. What happened was we had a lot of patients in Australia that a lot of patients, a lot of people in Australia, as soon as they tested positive, they went to the hospital without having any, you know, severe symptoms or problems. And it just caused a huge spread. So this was to be able to check which patients have been tested positive and then to get them onto the system. And they would submit their vitals and symptoms three to five day, five times a day. And we had, we created an algorithm with the doctors to be able to um, assign a risk assessment for them. So whether they were low risk, medium risk or high risk, and then to act accordingly. So this was trialed with over two hospitals. We had 110 patients. Um, we also won an award for this uh, uh, paper. And we started with no data. So we had to actually create mock data to be able to get the algorithms working. And we tweaked it a couple of times, I think, once we deployed it in the real world setting. And we actually had um, the sensitivity and specificity was 100% and 97.3%. So it was actually quite successful. Paramedic. Um, so this one was the pre-hospital notification system that I'd mentioned. Um, and what we did was there's a lot of paperwork in the current um, medical settings. So the paramedics fill out paperwork. There's also radio calls. Um, and then the hospitals fill out paperwork. So the data that is actually captured by the paramedics does not go to the doctor or the surgeon that's in the emergency bay. There's Chinese whisper, information is lost, and they don't have the right information for them to prepare the, the beds. As well as um, at the hospital settings, you also have the admitting officer who needs to speak to all the paramedics to try and identify which one is the most important case to let them in first. So there's a lot of time that's being wasted. We also have the problem of ramping time. So ramping time is when the ambulances are waiting outside of the hospital to try and get the patient in. Um, there are times where it's four to six hours where a patient can wait in the ambulance outside of the hospital before being admitted into the hospital. So it's a huge problem in Australia. And we've created this app to be able to streamline the whole process and to um, make it more efficient. So time isn't wasted, all the information is sent 
There's a triaging algorithm as well. So for the admitting officer knows which person patient needs to come in first rather than having to ask and talk to all the paramedics. Um, so we're still trying to push to get this, um, to expand it and be able to collect data from the equipment within the ambulance directly as well. So Vibe Up, we have, I think it's about 30% of university students um, suffer from depression in Australia. It's a big problem. And so what we're doing, what we did was we used um, Bayesian optimization to try and have participants to try and personalize activities to participants that were in the system. So we had a set of activities and we would ask them questions and based on their feedback, we would try and find the intervention that was best suited for them. Um, so this one trial, we had over, we had 1,500 participants um, in two states and it's, it's we are doing more trials and I think we're currently looking at putting it into schools as well. So this one here is with the company Carbon Revolution. It's a, a spin-off company from Deakin University that makes carbon fiber rims. And the project that we the project that we worked on was to be able to use, use image processing to identify when there's a defect in the a rim during the manufacturing process so that you can stop the, the process at that point in time rather than waiting for the whole wheel to finish and then go through the QA to figure out that it's faulty and then throw it away. So you're saving resources, you're saving materials, um, being able to pick it up at that point. We've also been looking at recently a lot of work um, in the generative AI space. Uh, there's been a lot of um, requests from Deakin University to be able to see how we can leverage generative AI into the um, education sector. Um, so one of my colleagues has put together um, a lifelong AI tutor. So this here again, looks at being able to um, personalize uh, answers to each student and to create um, education, educational material that is directed for their use. And this one here is for researchers. So we're looking at the using generative AI to provide feedback for um, grant proposals. Um, I think we're currently testing this one as well. So um, it will give you feedback and what actions should be um, taken by the researcher to fix up the proposal according to its assessment of the grant um, that you're, you're applying to. And this one again is for the researchers. This one is a structured um, grant proposal um, recommendation system. So based on what your research is, it recommends what grants are available for you to apply. So there's a car there's currently a system in Australia by the government that recommends grants um, that we all use. And it's very, very poor, not accurate at all. Um, so my colleague's been looking at using generative AI to, to be able to provide one that's that's a bit more robust. Okay, so this work is work that we do with defense. Um, so we have the autonomous assistant. And what we're doing is that with the autonomous system, we look at a lot of the data that the, um, the army has, and then being able to run multiple Monte Carlo simulations to find the causal causal effects, um, to be able to see what choices are made and what that impact has. The context aware search looks at um, topic modeling and meta modeling um, to look at to to construct query based knowledge graphs, um, and so it's obviously I think. My colleagues, the last test they did was on a um, frequently asked questions test that they did. Uh, so this here looks, um, it's has a better result, better outcome on common search tasks compared to other um, systems that currently exist. And again, this is applied all in defense. 
Um, so this is my colleague Muhammad's research, who's online as well, looking at chaos engineering and building anti-fragile systems. So be, being able to look at where the system failed and how can we fix that and adapt faster and improve making a more robust system. I think one of his PhD students was looking at the um, out of distribution in AI concept as well. So that's part of that too. And he'll be able to talk to you more about that. So the integrated task modeling environment, um, this looks at simulating uh, the navigators in the Black Hawk helicopter and being able to examine their cognitive load, uh, looking at collecting real-time data to analyze their behavior. I think I've got an example of this one. So it's just a simulation being able to um, get feedback and see what uh, activities they've done and how they did it and how they performed. So there's a lot of, in the defense space, they request a lot of feedback uh, in real time from when they do their training. This is the procedural generation. So it's a simulated environment that's created on the fly. Um, so as the um, you have the player that walks, the the environment is created without having to be hard coded. Um, and this is trying to create environments to be able to perform training where they don't need to go out into the real world. So as he's moving into the new section, that section has been created at that time. The war gaming platform, um, again, this is for after action reviews. So they're looking at transitioning the war gaming that they currently do from the static boards to simulated boards. Obviously, when you you have it into a simulated platform, you're able to collect data and record all their interactions and movements um, across the different war games. And then from that, they can review what was done and provide feedback to the actual um, soldiers. These are the commercial successes that we've had. Um, so these are all actually on the market at the moment. Uh, that's it. Thank you very much for listening. If you have any questions. Any questions? So my name is uh, Stasinov. I work here. Uh, hi. Uh, so in, in uh, uh, I, I mostly work on a, a Non, on symbolic knowledge presentation based systems, you know, not connections, no statistical systems. So I was curious if that system is uh, uh, connectionist or symbolic, uh, first of all, and then um, how do you train it and evaluate it in any case? How do we train? How do we train? train. How, sorry. The TRNR system. Okay, the TRNR system is a recommendation system. It takes live information from vital sign monitors the algorithm ha has been predetermined by the uh by the clinician so we we test it um using particular methods that uh are standard within the medical profession and and that is then um used um we did a we did a 33 month trial um we had over 1000 patients come through the system there was a there were two trauma bays with the technology, two trauma bays without the technology um, in, installed, and we then um, uh, we video we videotape we got we got um, um, authorization to videotape um, the activities that were going on within the trauma bay for the first thirty minutes of a trauma patient arriving. This is only for the first thirty minutes of a trauma patient arriving. Uh, once they once they come into the trauma center. Typically, they get they get kept alive. They go through a, a CT scan. Um, they work out what the problems are, and then they go straight into theatre to fix things like um, uh, broken bones in the pelvis, ruptured spleens, 
Um, uh, if there's head injuries, they have to go and and have a neurosurgeon um, and perform a particular um, activity associated with reducing the pressure in their um, in in their in in their head. So this this system is a recommendation system. You, this is not this is not something that they have to adhere to. It's just picking up all of the vital sign information, making sure that in and the reason why we do this is because we know that a clinician in uh, in the first thirty minutes has to make a decision every seventy two seconds. This this is this is proven because it was a world first. Every seventy two seconds they need to make a decision, and it's a very very complex environment. So things get missed. So our error. So we picked up the errors of omission, things that they forgot to do, because they there were too many too many com competing factors. This system allows for this information to and and make sure that they are not missing things, and therefore we reduce the errors of omission by twenty one percent. We reduce the amount of blood being administered by thirty percent, and the the errors of omission, the reduction of the errors of omission in Australia which we have a very, very good healthcare system, um, was 21, it's about five or six lives a year saved in the trauma set, center alone. Um, in, in places like India and places like Saudi Arabia, they were, the, the errors of emission were much higher. So that the reduction was much, much higher because of their practices are not as good as the practices in Australia. So, so, so the system effectively knows a script, if I understand correctly, about what should be done and when. And then, there, there, uh, there, there is a medical, there is a medical protocol that has to uh, take place. Yes, so there is a protocol, with specific steps, and then it goes through the protocol and estimates uh, more or less uh, where the situation happens to be along the, the script by reading vitals, right? But it has no way of knowing. If the action has been performed or not, so yeah, yes, yes, might... yes, it does. Yes, it does because there is a there is a nurse who is who has a separate screen that information gets pushed put into that particular um into that system. Now, what we what we're now looking at is how do we how do we even automate that system? So we don't we don't need to have a nurse all the time. Um, that's something that we're working on. That's something that we're working on right now. Okay, so then uh, how, uh, what I would suggest as an evaluation would be uh, not uh, having such a, a protocol following guideline uh, versions, not having it at all, but uh, having this uh, computerized uh, system versus having uh, the nurse holding a piece of paper in her hand that has the steps and then shouting out at the doctors every time they actually miss a step. Not, and, uh, and that anyway. and and that and that's what they did in the trial because in the trial there were two trauma bays with the technology and a nurse scribe and two trauma bays without the technology but they still had a nurse who had to still write things on a piece of paper right and shout at them if they missed this step correct but they that, that, but but there were many times when they they missed things because the nurse is not as well trained as the as the um, trauma doctor or the trauma consultant. Right, but she's smarter than the computer. Uh, she's computer, not against she, the doctor, right? No, that's right, yes. Right, so she's better than the computer or not? No, no, the, 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 no, no, the, the, the computer, she sits in front of another screen, which is a touch screen, and she will, she will observe what the doctors have done. So if the doctor says, you know, the airway, the question will be, is the airway equal? And the question will be, is the airway equal? And, and she will either say yes or no. If it's a yes, then then they, there's no nothing that has to happen in that particular case. If it's no, then they have to check which side of the airway is, is unequal. And in many cases, they have to do a tube insertion to relieve the the pressure of the the um, of that particular um, uh, left or right side. Because if the, if they don't release the pressure or the the fluid, the patient dies. Right. Right. But sure, but uh, I mean, does the nurse remind them that they have to do that because she has the no? It comes up. It comes up. It comes up on a big, um, sixty-five inch screen in the um in the trauma bay, and the nurse will ask the clinician. And there's more than one clinician. There's a head doctor and a number of junior doctors that sit around that bay. There are something like, um, fifteen people in that trauma bay when they look after that patient. Um, from 
automatic x-rays to nurses to um, anaesthetists to um, to uh, uh, general surgeons and, and so on, yes. So the nurse will call out. If, if it hasn't been heard or hasn't been enacted by the clinician, she will call out because the system will say, has the airway been, is the airway equal? She, and if they don't, if they don't respond, she will call it out. Right. So I, so I don't understand what the difference is uh, still between the two setups, the automated one and the manual one. So because the there's, there is... th because there's transcription, there's transcription errors. They can't read the, as I said, they have to make a decision every 72 seconds. The nurses can't keep up. My guess is that the difference is in complexity. I think the system is, com is complex enough for to be difficult to be managed. Because what would the mess look at? The protocol. First you do that, then you do yeah. that. Yeah. If yeah. the yeah. nurse the protocol has one thousand steps. Does it? I don't know. How many steps and if the nurse does the protocol take? Oh, there's there's quite a number. Um it's it's quite quite a significant uh Number. This is based around the work that was done at the um, both at the Alfred Hospital in Melbourne and the University of Baltimore um, uh, Shock Trauma Hospital in Baltimore, um, which is the largest uh, trauma hospital in in the US. Uh, that this was based on. Yeah. Yeah, but how complex is it? Um, in in terms of uh, in terms of uh, what we see today. In the in in our world, it's not it's not very complex. But I built this system um, fifteen years ago, and we right. made a, a a new iteration of that. All we're now doing is trying to collect all the information that the system has collected, as in what were the uh, what were the um, uh, all of the diagnoses, what were what was recorded, what wasn't, what was confirmed, what wasn't confirmed, and we're going to put that through us a. a a uh, a learning um, module so that we can we can extract where some of the things um, uh, that that we need to be paying more attention to um, need to be, but we haven't done that yet because we're still collecting. You know, we, we still need to collect a significant amount of data. We can't do it on small amount small amount of data. We need large we need large data sets. Right. So I still don't understand why. My guess would be. You know, if you, it's if, not you if you imagine of the cases or the, the variety of different cases that uh, we have to deal with, uh, my yeah, guess is that we're, different books. we're talking we're talking about hundreds of first steps. Are we? I don't know. I, I haven't there's, heard the number yet. So there's um in the TRNR case, I don't know, but having worked with what's the question, Elena? So Sorry. how many if would there be in that 70, 72 seconds of the decision point where the nurse would have to make a call out? No, no, the, so no, the, the nurse doesn't the nurse doesn't make the call, the clinician makes the decision. So, yeah, for the so if there is in the standard when you're looking at the trial and there's the comparison, right? And you have mm -hmm. the nurse that the manual operations, right? And then mm -hmm. so we're not looking we've got the nurse that looks at the the, the way that it's currently or was done. With the manual so call in, out. It, yeah, yeah, the manual call out, the so nurse. Many, for example, how many if else? You know how paramedic has the whole set of guidelines where you got to make all these decisions in a split second, which Correct. hospital are you going to take, right? Correct. So yes. how many points are there in that 72 seconds for a decision to be made? Or for how many data points? Calls? How many how many decision data points? Decision points. Or how many how much information is coming in? So, so information is coming in from the vital sign monitor. It's also coming in from um, the algorithm itself because it's it's time based. You know, it's from it's manually from the manual operation. From so the manual the operation, is, they... is pretty much why would you go to an automated system when a nurse does it? Because they have because we reduce the errors of emission by twenty one percent. That's why. So there's the manual error that's done by the nurse. Mm -hmm. Without the system, um, even though they're very, very good at it, we we Is still it, were able to we we were we were able to improve the errors of emission by twenty one percent. That was the difference. 
yes. uh, so like having worked my understanding is from your perspective you're saying well if the nurse can do it and she does it accurately why would you have a system right no but the nurse but the nurse doesn't do it accurately i am trying to figure out um what is it that the nurse was doing wrong that has been automated so what was it that? That's a good question. What is it that the nurse was the doing wrong? Analysis. Where is the, the nurse, error? The nurse, the nurse doesn't nurse... have the ability to track temporal events as efficiently as an automated system. Yeah. We can also we can also give you you know we can we can we can send a demo of exactly what's been done um, at uh, at the you know in this particular system. But nurses don't have the they they can't track everything. And this by by using this particular system um, and these temporal events um, more efficiently using the automated system. Um, we we also have a symbolic um, temp temporal workflow engine that's based around data extraction from from the clinicians. Can I change the discussion a bit? Um, has, has this been? Have you thought about? Um, refining the uh, using machine learning yes that's what they're currently working on at the moment so we're still trying to collect data from the different aspect from the different hospitals to be able to do that so that's the next step okay. so it's constantly being um progressed and developed the first step was to to build a system that would allow us to collect this information and you need large volumes of data to do this machine learning um, once we've got that um and you know we we can then start um you know going through that uh through that data and picking up all the different uh activities things like um and and i think raj is, is pointing a few things out um the nurses don't have the ability um uh to process information as efficiently and effectively um you know what medication has been given uh what time that medication was being given and if there's there needs to be more medication given to um, you know, subdue the patient because they need to either do an intubation or whatever it might be. These are very, very, very sick people that are hanging on a very small thread. Um, these are typically patients that have um, been involved in um, motor accidents. They've been hit by cars. They've they've fallen off cliffs. They um, they've fallen off uh, ladders over three meters in in height. And typically, um, they what they're trying to do is keep them alive so that they can assess what uh, damage has been done so that they can take them into uh, uh, into surgery and perform the appropriate surgery for these to keep uh, to, to rectify the problem. Um, stab wounds, gun gunshots, all of those things are what typically um, happen within um, the first 30 minutes of, a, of these type of patients arriving. Um, our biggest problem is our biggest problem is that cognitive load, and um, errors or errors of omission is 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 uh, is the most important thing. The clinicians just sometimes forget to do it. Well, we're, or our system is just reducing the errors of omission. That's all we're doing. Great, great. Any other anybody else have a question about this or any other type of uh, presentation? Sorry, I didn't hear that, Anna. Oh, they're just asking if anyone's got any more questions. Oh, oh okay, sorry. Uh, I would like to to learn uh, some more information on the, uh, as, as discussed by George before the, the talk, uh, we are very interested in the cognitive assessment tool. So mm -hmm. we worked on uh, very, very similar models. Not only the one that George mentioned, the Langaware, which is also a spin-off for detecting of uh, Alzheimer's, but we have also prognostic models, which uh, these are not commercialized, but uh, they were just algorithms we used uh, in the in the context of uh, biomedical projects. So actually, we, we did it with the people that are here, like George Katibras, uh, with some prognostic mod models for Alzheimer's or other diagnostic models based on uh, um, uh, the clinical records uh, uh, get got from uh, biobanks of uh, UK patients. So uh, what I would like to to ask, and uh, uh, if if available, and if if you can share more information about this, is um, 
uh, what kind of data did you use for this cognitive assessment tool? And uh, uh, also, if you use the deep learning models, so what kind of uh, algorithm uh, were uh, were trained to uh, assess the, the cognitive status of a patient? Raj, do you want to actually comment? Uh, yes. Uh, yeah, I was just typing it in. Yeah, we, they, the end users uh, play uh, computer games on the apps. So we give them uh, memory games and there is a sequence of games that uh, were defined by dementia research. That uh, And then we're watching uh, how good their recall is, how fast they're able to play the game. So time, recall, and precision, and error. So these are metrics we have for five different kinds of games over three months. If you have, say, a different model, uh, we could then cross-reference with this app and see if the app or if the game is as efficient as a more uh, prognostic-based model but using a different set of parameters, for instance. Uh, so we, we didn't use any deep learning here. It was very simple, uh, pretty much, because we were not aiming to do a diagnosis uh, to avoid a number of complications. So we rank the time it's taken and plot it, uh, and that's what they show the doctor, the GP. The GP is then doing a, an assessment based on that. But the intent here is to give them a method to prod them to go see an expert who will then do a more complex assessment. Yeah, just, just I thought to, uh, to insist a bit on that. Raj, uh, this is George speaking. Um, so you mean that you actually show uh, some care to a doctor or, and you don't make, um, you don't have a threshold where you no. raise them? Something like no. That. No, no. So we we just say that three months ago they were playing this game at this at this rate. Right now they have deteriorated maybe on memory and precision. Oh, sorry, on on recall things like that. Recall tasks, memory tasks, uh, and time. So if they're taking a bit longer to do certain tasks, so we plot it and, as a chart. And accuracy. And, 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 and accuracy. And accuracy. And accuracy. So and accuracy. so one of the things we use on on a mobile device we use something called Fitz's law, which you know was used in. 19, in the 1950s when people were being put on production lines and they had to pick out faulty items as the product as the products were moving in front of them but it's exactly the same um, technique that we use um, to uh, to look at how how precise they are at a mobile device okay you want to, you want to If there is anybody, nobody else asking questions, uh, I have one more in a different uh, different project that you that you mentioned. You mentioned something about a different way to do clinical trials, but you went through it very quickly. Can you say a bit more about that? The Raj, you need to talk. Yeah, yeah. Raj, yeah, I can. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So typically with clinical trials, the gold standard is a randomized control trial. Randomized control trials uh, can take up to 10 years if they're structured correctly and uh, and done efficiently. Our idea was, and, and you get to randomize once uh, a set of parameters, and then you run your calculations based on that pretty much. So you pick one or two control variables and then randomize the rest, and then you, you apply your intervention on a population. So that's the basic model in a, a RCT. Our idea was to see if we can do it faster by doing an incremental adaptive trial. So adaptive trials have been done in the past, which is supposed to be like a, a better way to do RCTs or a different way to do RCTs faster. For this, um, So we do exactly the same thing. So each, tri each trial is a mini trial. So instead of taking the entire population, we take a sample of a subset of the population, give them a set of interventions. We learn from that and we keep aggregating at a population level. So the trial two will learn from trial one, trial three will learn from trial one and two, trial four will run, learn from one, two, three, and so on. And we are applying a Bayesian optimization strategy uh, on a small data set. So the issue is to ensure that we, we extract good signal even though we have very small data set. 
without deterioration from the noise uh, that we would normally get here. Uh, so that's the basic idea behind it. And so we are trying to find the right intervention for the right population group. So the, this particular set of experiments, this is a common problem we have in lots and lots of experiments. Uh, people don't have a lot of budget and they want to avoid, they want to eliminate bad interventions as fast as possible. So for that, this is extremely good. Uh, and if the intervention works, then it is as effective as an RCT. So eventually, if, if does it reduce the time to get to a successful result? Because yes. I understand that you yes you are yes fairly, but does it? I mean, event you know, if you want to get to a if if there, if there is a drug that works, would it not eventually have to go through many many steps? which are equivalent to the to doing the RCT to start with? Yes, that is the current uh, gold standard. That is correct. We are looking to see if we can come up with an alternative way to achieve the same outcome faster. But I'm trying to understand why is it faster? Uh, because we're going with... Uh, because you're not doing as large a sample size and you're not doing it for as long. So you're trying to do it faster by learning in each increment. So eventually the population that you will need to get to the same, to the, the positive result will be uh, smaller. That's correct. Yeah, we can do it faster, with higher confidence. Yes, that's correct. So as soon as we start to see the pattern is there, uh, because you have four different interventions, you're trying to find... So there are two things that are happening. One here is personalization. So it may be that intervention one works better for a certain category of population, but not so for a different category of population. So, so it will look for that. And the second thing is for the good intervention that works broadly, it will find it faster. So at least that was our hypothesis. The current experiment is saying it looks like it is working. Uh, the technique we've taken looks like it's working. So we we hope that uh, as time goes by, for some kinds of medical interventions, this this strategy would be more efficient. And don't you get arguments that uh, you, you don't have statistical? Uh, yes, we do. We do. We do get it. Yeah, we do. There are people who are who are this who are not convinced of our statistical approach. That is correct. And there are people yeah. who are supportive of it. So we have both sides right now. Yeah, I understand. I come I come from a, an area. I mean, the, my interest in that is uh, comes from an area which is even harder than that because I'm I'm interested in uh, clinical trials for ra very rare diseases where yep. RCTs are not possible, right? Yes, uh, and, that is correct. And yeah. Furthermore, some of those rare genetic diseases they also yep. have significant. So you also need personalization within the small yep. sample that you have, which That's makes correct. any practically impossible. But you still have yes. to somehow start with working. Um, yeah. I'm really interested in that. Yeah. Um, so this the platform we built is uh, there's there's two components. One is of course the uh, Bayesian optimization technique. The second thing is we are we have built a platform that allows us to scale experiments and do this at scale. Uh, like uh, do this quickly with mobile phones. So you could say, I want to collect a certain category of data and then you can manually define the the, the statistical technique you want to apply at like a descriptive level. And then the rest of it is done by the automated software system that we developed. Are you using any uh, documentation, any virtual patient data? We just started that right now. Yeah, we just started that right now. Uh, where we are exploring, we are actually looking at data augmentation and data synthesis for study design validation. So the intent here is to actually use AI. So imagine you, before you recruit your population, you want to know if your study design holds. So we are using uh, agents to mimic our population groups and see if the study design broadly yields the kind of data shape that we think we would get um and of course we still have to do the real test but it is mostly as a 
sanity check on the study design. But in this, in the context of medical, we don't do direct aut that augmentation. Maybe missing data imputation, but no augmentation. Okay, thank you. Any other questions? None. What about the people who are online? Do you, do they know if you have any questions? Have any questions? Any uh, I have a very small uh, technical question. So uh, for Sophie, what type of sensors do you use? Sorry, what was that again? So for Sophie Hub, what sensors were oh, used? Oh, okay. Okay. So the sensors that were originally used for Sophie Hub were the Samsung uh, motion sensors and, uh, and, and the other sensors that were made available over a period of time. The work that we did with Sophie Hub, um, we, we designed, Raj and I designed it um, coming back from the US in 2014. And, uh, and uh, I couldn't sleep on the plane. So Raj and I um, had to... Uh, uh, I, I woke him up and said, "We've got work to do here, and uh, this is how we we built Sophie Hub." And over the over over time, sensors became more and more affordable, and 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 different sensors became available. Like, you know, if uh, um, you know a sensor that would pick up if the tap had been left on for too long, or you know there was a, uh, a, a the, the the fridge was not open, so you know uh, it's a reed switch basically. Um, or a uh, you know we could we could pick up the temperature within within a particular room. So if an elderly person didn't turn the air conditioning on and it and it went above a particular threshold, we could inform them that you know we we noticed that it's too hot in the room. You should turn the air conditioner on. Um, they were the type of sensors that are made available on Sophie Hub at the moment. There are a raft of new sensors that are being produced every day now. But when we when we built the system and uh, made it available um, commercially. They were the sensors that were reliable because there was a lot of unreliable sensors coming out of China as well. Okay. Uh, so my second question is: uh, Can the user select what uh, he wants to detect, or is it uh, some kind of fixed? Uh, it uh, was uh, yeah. Back then, we did it as a rule-based system, more or less, more or less. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Obviously, today we have you know better techniques and better technology that allows us to allow the user to pick and choose what they want to be um, sensing. Yeah. Any other questions? All right. Well, thank you, Jack. Κυρίε και κύριοι, ευχαριστούμε πάρα πολύ που παραβρεθήκατε και θα σα ξαναδούμε του χρόνου. Ευχαριστούμε. Καλό βράδυ. Καλημέρα σα. Bye.